and we can be, we can uh, begin. Yes, th uh, thank you all for the invitation to speak with you uh, uh, th this evening. Wish, of course, I could be with you uh, in person, but uh, we're all uh, circumstances being what they are. We will we will make the make the best of it. Um, my, my apologies also that my my talk will be uh, only in English. My my German is not um, not acceptable, but I, I have. Um, I have placed certain sections of the text uh, of the lecture uh, on the slides that should facilitate <clears throat> uh, following along with some of the more uh, complex, complex passages. Mm -hmm. um, in, in general, let me say that um, the, the, the talk this evening around uh, what planetary scale computation is for could be seen as, is, is part, of, um, part of some of the research that is going into the next book, the follow-up to the stack, um, which, uh, and in, in in simple terms, we could say that if the stack was a book that was uh, trying to define what planetary scale computation is, um, the next book is, as the title suggests here, um, trying to ask what what it is for, well, what purposes could it could it be uh, could it be put to, um, and and for those who are l less familiar, um, I assume many of you have some some familiarity with the work, but this this book that. Uh, it published in, in 2015, the stack on software and sovereignty. Um, uh, it, it was where I sort of tried to lay out uh, a perhaps rather ambitious um, historical political philosophy of the emergence of planetary scale computation. As a technical apparatus, this what is suggested is sort of suggested an accidental megastructure, um, but also as a social and uh, institutional system, uh, one in which that boundary between the technical and the institutional is perhaps uh, is perhaps a bit blurred. In short, the idea is that uh, the, with the emergence of planetary scale computation, um, we that, that we see we see um, uh, really two key dynamics is what the book is looking at. One is that the emergence of planetary scale computation both distorts and deforms traditional um, Westphalian, let's say, uh, models of political geography and and produces new territories in its own image. Which has a kind of scrambling effect on the structure of, of the geopolitical, but also that all the different genres of planetary scale computation, from um, uh, uh, energy sourcing, the cloud computing, our, our topic for today, um, uh, ur ur uh, digital urbanism, artificial intelligence, uh, a uh, 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 VR, and so forth, can be understood not as a bunch of different species of computing kind of spinning out on their own, but of forming a kind of coherent. Uh, a, a coherent and regularized, uh, 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 disc massively but discontiguous uh, accidental megastructure we call the stack. And this diagram by Metahaven, uh, the only image in the book, uh, lays out a bit of a diagram of what we're speaking to. But in short, the idea is that at the Earth layer, we, we witness how ecological flows become sites of intensive sensing, quantification, <clears throat> and governance. Um, the cloud layer where platform economies create virtual geographies in their own image. Um, uh, at a city layer where vast discontiguous networks weave themselves into different enclaves and escape routes. A ver an addressing layer where the identification and nomination of billions and billions of little entities and events form unfamiliar maps. An interface layer that presents vibrant augmentations of reality that stand in for extended cognition. And finally, a user layer where we reside, populated both by humans and non-humans um, that, that, that steer and are steered by this accidental megastructure. Now, one of the key phenomenon that has, has, has defined the, the, the career of, of, the, of, this, of this planetary scale computation since the book was published, was a kind of geopolitical bifurc uh, 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 forking um, of not in such that we see not a stack, not a single stack at a global level, but rather a kind of mitosis of the stack genera into multiple, uh, what we call multi multipolar hemispherical stacks, such that the, the development of a multipolar geopolitics uh, and the emergence of multipolar uh, 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 of a kind of multipolarity of planetary scale computation can be seen not as two distinct phenomenon, but in fact the same, uh, but in fact the same thing. Um, 
these uh, the multipolar hemispherical stacks um, are structured in relationship in the sense to the sovereignty that they engender. Their, their geographic scope, uh, their procedural integration of data as a kind of sovereign substance um, uh, is how they produce the territories over which they uh, which they govern, um, they govern and, and, and supervise. In, and so all of the sort of discussions about the US, the US stack versus the China stack, uh, the EU as a kind of, uh, of as, a, as a kind of uh, a, a Galapagos stack within the, within this larger framework, the Eurasian stack, all of these are ways in which not only that we can understand the role of technology in the development of the multipolar geopolitics, we can understand that this construction of, of, of geographically segmented technical infrastructures, in fact, is the geopolitics of the moment. Now, inclusive in this, of course, is also just a bit of discussion of, of artificial intelligence, which is not, not really the topic of this, this particular talk, but it, it's interesting to note how in the, pre, in the past few previous years, um, each each of the uh, of the these multipolar hemispherical stacks obliged itself to produce a uh, an AI policy white paper by which it defined artificial intelligence not only as a subject matter through which their geopolitical vision would be articulated, but in fact as the basis of this vision. Um, first Xi, then Macron. Uh, finally, someone wrote one for Trump. But as a kind of genre, uh, of, as a genre of geopolitical discourse, this 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 nomination articulation of AI as the basis of the strategy is another way in which um, this confluence of the geotechnological and the geopolitical uh, comes together which is in fact the subject of, of, of the talk. The question then about um, what else in fact can planetary scale computation do? And what are the other models for planetary scale computation uh, that we have and that we need uh, that are different than the commercial platforms, that are different than the way in which Google or Facebook or Amazon organizes uh, or, or, or Tencent or, 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 or Alibaba organizes planetary scale computation? Uh, and we have other models, one of which is climate science. Um, climate science, and, and, uh, it, it, and that is, climate science is, is a way in which we have, we have constructed a planetary scale sensing, mo calculation, modeling, and simulation apparatus that has produced a image and conception of the planet uh, that has provided us with, with fundamental knowledge. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the the con the very concept of climate change itself not obviously the ecological the real chemical ecological phenomenon but the concept of climate change the model of the statistical regularity that we refer to climate change is itself an epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation without that sensing modeling calculation simulation apparatus from satellites to temperatures to the 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 the, the supercomputing simulations the very idea of climate change itself would not have been provided uh, would not have been possible uh, to produce other than this to this technical abstraction and this idea of how a planet comes to know itself how a planet comes to know itself is where the question of planetary scale computation and asking what it's for and the question of what is and what should be planetarity per se, a question that is um, uh, an important one within philosophy and humanities more generally, begin to come together. And that, in fact, is what our, our talk will be about. One of the key ideas then within this, uh, if we take climate science as a model, is the role of sensing and modeling and, and sensing and modeling and simulation. This has implications not only for how you describe a technical apparatus of climate science, it also describes the epistemological function of this apparatus. It describes part of the politics of the apparatus. It has everything to do with why some societies were able to respond to the pandemic well and other societies responded really poorly. They had the inability or unwillingness to incorporate sensing, modeling, and simulation technologies and how it is the society knows itself. Now, in terms of where this goes and where this where this is headed and how we could steer this towards a viable planetarity, one of the ideas I suggest that we need to keep in mind is, is 
towards a transformation towards that viable, a, a more viable uh, function for planetary scale computation is that in many ways, the technology may precede the politics. The technology may even cause the politics that instead of seeing the situation such that first we can have a transformation in culture, then a transformation in politics, which will bring about a transformation in the geotechnology that we need. The history of technology tells us in many respects that transformations in the technology are just as likely to bring about the transformations in the politics and the the politics and the economics. And if this is if this is so, then this only focuses the question of what is the geopolitics and geoeconomics that is implied by planetary scale computation that could be constructed in relationship to it, which may be very different, as I say, from the way it's used today. Again, to draw this back to the to the uh, to the question of the of the the timely question of the pandemic. One of the lessons of the pandemic, I think a valuable lesson for post-pandemic politics is what we could call the epidemiological mode of society. Epidemiologists, whereas, whereas current cloud platforms or Googles and Facebooks and so forth, model society as a collection of individuals, individual profiles, individual actors who aggregate together into some kind of uh, assemblage or, 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 or collective, but fundamentally the individual, the sovereign encapsulated atomic individual is the base unit of how it understands society. Um, this is, I think, a pathology and, and part of the reason why our systems uh, are, work as poorly as they do. Epidemiologists don't see society that way. They don't see society as a series of, of atomic individuals. They see society as a by, as as a population of inter of intermingled and interentangled uh, bio, biological creatures as vectors through which uh, information and and other organisms such as viruses will pass. This collective conceptualization of society, this materialist biological conceptualization of society, this is a better model. Of, of society than the one that is currently provided to us by planetary scale computation and its, and its obsession with the atomic sovereign individual. Now, again, in terms of the pandemic, one of to this question of sensing, one of the things that if we think of the pandemic as a kind of massive experiment in comparative governance, where different societies had to deal with the with the virus uh, in different ways. Societies that were successful were ones that were able to able to sense what was going on within them that were able to produce equitable and inclusive and accurate descriptive models of themselves and their own and their own and their own processes this capacity for sensing became that became a is a fundamental technology of care and the exclusion of certain populations of underserved populations from this sensing layer became the basis of their uh, uh, be, be, became the basis of, of, of different forms of of social injustice this should, I argue, change some of the conversations we are used to having around surveillance. I'm arguing in this sense that part of the problem of surveillance within current versions of planetary scale computation is not so much that we have large society scale platforms sensing what is going on in society and producing models of it. That's also even what climate science does. The real problem is in the way in which it uh, in true Foucauldian fashion, individuates its its field of observation into these atomic uh, encapsulated um, individual profile structures. That the real primary problem here is this over individuation and conception of society in the first place. Part of the in implications of this is that certain critiques of surveillance, such as those associated with Shoshana Zuboff, for example, don't quite get it right in that they're quite correct that the platforms operate in this, in this pernicious and manipulative way, but instead of seeing that as a kind of inappropriate contractual relationship between a legal, liberal, sovereign individual and some kind of platform, we need to go deeper than that and realize that this construction of society around the understood, understand as a collective of, of, of as, a, as a collection of uh, of these liberal individual subjects is itself is a is a mismodeling of society and a mismodeling of society in the first place, and a disindividuation, a disindividuation of how it is that we 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 use uh, use these platforms to model ourselves 
um, is a fundamental is is a fundamental step, and I'm not sure that that's one that the uh, the more kind of legal theory of computation that so that that Zuboff, for example, would promote um, is willing to accept. Now, here's a here's a in, in that sense a more fundamental point. There are certain technologies for whom for which their primary social function or their primary social impact is in is instrumental in what they allow us to do that this technology allows us to act upon the world in a way that's different than we could have without this technology. And this is its, its instrumentality. There are other kinds of technologies, however, where the primary impact, social impact is, is epistemological more than it is instrumental. That is by using the technology, we discover something fundamental about how the world works. And we discover something through using the technology, we discover something fundamental about how we think about how we think and how the world works in relationship to one another. A microscope in this sense is a, an epistemological technology. It changes our understanding of the scalar relationship of biological life and its interrelationship. A telescope was an epistemological technology without this capacity for alienating vision of transforming and distorting vision through the telescope, heliocentric models of, of, the, of our solar system would have been much more unlikely. And so part of the question then is what is the epistemological function of planetary scale computation? Now, uh, to answer that, let me sort of ask you to sort of cl close your eyes and sort of imagine, uh, imagine a scenario. If you would imagine, the, think of the blue marble image, the famous image of the earth. If you would imagine this not as, as a, uh, uh, imagine this instead of an image, imagine this as a movie, one that fast, a movie that fast forwards through the 4.5 billion year history of the planet. What you would see in this movie as it fast forwards is continents emerging, splitting and consolidating, asteroid strikes, and all of the rest played out in this big giant and the biggest nature video of all. And at the very end of this film, uh, in the last few minutes, we'd see the last ice age ending, and the polar caps retreating. And then in the last few seconds of the big movie, we'd see something very unusual compared to what has happened up to this point. We would see the planet wrap itself in wires and satellites and antenna and cables and more, forming this intricate inorganic crust, uh, extending even up into the atmosphere we would see the emergence of planetary scale computation as a geological as well as geophilosophical fact. And so then unlike before, uh, the planet is here thus able to, uh, capable of systemic self-sensing, self-modeling, self-simulation. Um, and if you were a Gaia person, you might say, well, it's always been that way. It's always this way. And, and I wouldn't argue that uh, natural computation um, it, it, it is infinitely more complex than any of the artificial versions we could construct. But that doesn't, and I think, do anything to dampen um, the novelty of a planet suddenly folding its materials into this new sensory organ and cognitive labor that's capable of calculating things like um, the planet, I, this planet is getting warmer. Um, uh, how old is this planet? Uh, and this capacity for technical abstraction at a scale uh, is, I think, a fundamental shift, um, not just historically, but arguably geologically, uh, geologically as well. This is, the, this is sort of the, the, the site condition, if you like, the framework by which the question of what is uh, planetary scale computation as an epistemic technology look like. For example, um, perhaps to our shame, there never was a, a campaign that asked the question, why haven't we seen a photograph of a black hole as there was a photograph of the whole earth? Nevertheless, though, in 2019, one appeared uh, and immediately took its place uh, among a small group, I would argue, of the most significant images made by human technology. But for what are these images significant and how so? Well, one of the things, one of the ways has to do with how it was made and, what, and how it was made in relationship to this, this planetary condition. The thing that we see as an that we see as an image was constructed from data produced not by a conventional camera, but by the Event Horizon, a, a network of telescopes harmonized to focus on the same location at the same time, as you see here. Now, the resolution of any image depends on the aperture of the camera, and this particular non-contiguous perception engine of the 
Event Horizon Telescope Array, linked telescopes, as you see, from Greenland to Antarctica, an aperture as wide as the Earth. Now, to, and so to make this image, our planet itself became a camera, peering out and looking back in time at ancient light that traveled to Earth. And, in the, and indeed, in this case, looked out at time itself. So we can then think, in, in, in hearkening back to um, uh, Heidegger's uh, uh, misapprehension, the black hole image is a kind of world picture, uh, but one that is crucially not a picture of our Earth, but rather a picture taken by the Earth uh, of its surroundings, for which we served as an essential enablers. So you, can sort of, you can kind of imagine the Earth wrapped in the Event Horizon Telescope array as a kind of amoeba-like creature, at long last opening its little eye to sense what is immediately nearby. With its coordinated sensory cells, it sees not only that the space around it is empty, but it also focuses on a particular distant speck of hyperdense blackness, however unlikely that may be. The collected data is then aggregated by the tiny mammals uh, who live inside the camera, that's us, who render it into a visible figure that they can view and share. This changes a bit about, this changes quite a bit about how we may see ourselves in relationship to planetarity, but also in relationship to the planet's own capacity for sensing and modeling and structuring itself. And in the book, The Terraforming, I make, I, I, for, I make a rather elaborate distinction between the black hole image and the blue marble image, um, that, which concludes thusly, if the blue marble signaled a revitalized alloy of humanism and creationism, made by a single human looking in the mirror and framing his sense of place, looking down from above, then the black hole reveals a far more powerful inhuman scope and condition that defies articulation as it looks not only up, but out. If the blue marble implied a global village by putting apex creationists in charge of a mythical garden, black hole demands a different planetary regime by rendering humans as a privileged mediating residue that sets in motion further generalized cognition. The two worlds could not be more different. This is a new profile for us and one that will take some time to get used, for, used to. So then, let me shift then some of the discussion then to specifically this question of planetarity, um, but do so with a provisional conclusion. What is it for? Planetary scale computation should be understood as the means of and for the liberation and articulation of public reason, collective intelligence, and technical abstraction as, a, as collective self-representation and self-composition. And I'll speak to that in a moment. Now, before I go specifically to this question of planetarity, I want to first introduce, introduce this concept in a little bit, um, in, in, in a little bit sort of idiosyncratic way. And through the question of governance, which is how I would define this question of self-composition, define governance as a capacity for self collective self-composition and vice versa. So in some ways, this question is important. It, it, the, the, this focuses the question on, on planetary governance. And this comes down to in many ways what we mean by planetary in the first place. Um, there is on the one hand, a political and philosophical planetarity, which I'll speak to in a moment, um, that is put forward as an alternative to the notion of the global, which is understood as the kind of static and flattened and Eurocentric. For this, planetarity implies multiscalarity, the very small and the very large uh, at once. It implies both a deep time and a deep future. It implies depth of organic and inorganic entanglement. It implies understanding the earth, not so much as a world in the phenomenological sense, but as a planet in the geologic and geochemical sense. It implies human societies understanding themselves not as a virtual cultural layer on top of the planet, but rather to understand ourselves as we are something that planet to do. Planets fold themselves in particular ways to produce material assemblages, which in turn, that is us, produce the semiotics of human culture. We are not on the planet so much as we are of the planet. So the second then key connotation of planetarity is the astronomic, astronomic planetarity. Only in my lifetime, um, we have come to know uh, much of the most significant scientific knowledge about, how, about where we are and when we are. We've discovered dark matter and dark energy, which comprise most of the universe. We've discovered that the, the first exoplanets outside our solar system 
And perhaps most profoundly, at least for philosophy, we've also come to understand, and indeed, how alone we are. The idea that the universe was teeming with life um, persi uh, persisted even into the, in, into the 1970s in the scientific community, and it has been all but dashed. It's been replaced by a rare earth hypothesis that suggests not only are advanced civilizations rare, but life itself is incredibly rare. And it is even more incredibly unlikely that we would find ourselves in this particular moment. It is incredibly unlikely that this moment would even be a thing. What is not unlikely, however, uh, is that, ex that the extinction of the only species that we know of that is capable of understanding this moment as a moment, uh, and that is capable of understanding not only that it can compose itself, but indeed must compose itself, uh, is, is upon us. And that, in essence, is really the definition of governance that I would ask us to aspire to, not simply the exercise of public authority, but the exercise of collective reason. Planetary governance is or should be <clears throat> the exercise of our capacity for selective uh, collective self-composition, including the prevention of our own extinction. Now, the premise by which this anthropological planetarity is executed through an urban intervention, for example, um, is one that puts the philosophical connotation of uh, planetarity and the geologic and astronomic connotation in direct con uh, contact, if, also, if not also conflict. And as I'll try to explain, we should wish then to prosecute some of the given traditions of the Western philosophy of technology, which rotate, I argue, around a misrecognized subject with far too much belief in its own historical uniqueness and too much bad faith in what it imagines to have lost. Put differently, we would wish to, to, we would wish to render the map through which the world is and, and reform the map through which that epistemology is divided against itself pointing, we hope, at alternatives that have been there, uh, that have been there all along. The term planetarity appears in Western theory with Gayatri Spivak's coinage at the end of the last century, but the actual planet to which it refers is several billion years in the making. That is, there is a philosophical planetarity and an astronomic planetarity. And while the two have different unfoldings, the implications of one for the other should inspire correspondence, conjoining, mutual reinforcement. The interests of one should not be opposed to the other because there is no viable philosophical planetarity that does not define itself through the disclosures of the astronomic understanding of what a planet is and does, how it comes to know things about itself. And just as all of those insights must inform the premises upon which the rendering species comprehends itself as interior phenomenon to the planet, once again, not a figure subtracted from it. Both of these connotations, as, as should be clear, de de depart decisively from the global, uh, understood as the kind of static administrative curved plane, and do so on behalf of a deep and non-negotiable uncanniness. Both annihilate the pre-Darwinian fantasies of self-transparent subjects bound only by immaterial signifiers. Both undermine superstitions of place, horizon, and ground, and do so on behalf of an abyss of entanglement over time. One that sometimes assembles, is one that sometimes assembles itself into reasoning machines such as ourselves. We're not getting the forwarding is not working right. My apologies. Unfortunately, the career of the term has taken different, a different winding path. It has instead led, on the one hand, to a propositional and aspirational detechnologization, an embrace of discursivity against what it sees as the commanding violence of, for example, technological planetarity, self-sensing, and observation. This, this distinction is made. And the other hand, toward a well-heeled daydream that the condition of the planet, even one inst instrumentalized to observe black holes, um, can be reduced to a mere supply for equally immediate consumption without ramifications for how the next hundred uh, thousand or millions of years may play out. 
In other words, the conflation of the universality implied by human cohabitation of a single planet with a specific individuated European subjectivity as the site of the original emergence of that purported universality corresponds with the history of globalization, but not with the planetary conditions upon which it depends, nor importantly with their future. In locating earth sensing and modeling in that past and future, it's less than, again, this is in, uh, in contradistinction with, with, for, with Heidegger, it is less that the planet suddenly appeared as a world picture in visual culture than the particular world of a particular being was able to construct an exterior image that finally could present the planetary condition from which that being and that world emerged. But as said, it was there all along. Let me attempt to try to make this work a little bit differently um, so that you can see what we've prepared here. Uh, a, in that guys, a future geophilosophy must a future geophilosophy must be geophysical in attitude. Geophilosophy must be geophysical in attitude because both because thinking must recognize its own physicality, but thereby so that astronomy might continue to become a kind of cognitive science, that is, of how the planet thinks. That is both an integrated pursuit of how to think and know through a planetary condition, and also how a planet itself comes to know, a double whammy. This binding should be focused less as an ontology or grounding than as, a, as the gravitational pull that gives, ground, that gives ground the illusion of solidity. That is, because it is not certain, finally, uh, what the geopolitical implications of an astronomic planetarity and astronomic disenchantment will be. Um, the commitment is not one that for which there's only one geopolitics and one geopolitics only that is possible. That's the good news. There's no more of a direct relationship um, in our time than there was for the decades after Copernicus that led where they did. And while we insist on the resistance of the real against those who would reduce the human to the merely an affect of discourse, we recognize just how indifferent the real really is. So that is, while I strongly agree with, with the, the premises of Gyachi Spivak's connotation of planetarity, which I'll speak to in a moment, that the viable planetarity to come means a new language through which, um, a new language through which the human recognizes, um, through which the human recognizes uh, 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 it, how it is constituted by its planet. What does that mean if somehow that anthropo anthropogenesis is imagined as separate from its technogenesis? The philosophical planetarity fatally separated from the astronomic planetarity. Doesn't this foreclose, I argue, the possibility of what it calls for? For Spivak, planetarity is first proposed as a mode of literacy and, a literacy and literature. And of course, what she means by that is less that is far more than just the pedagogies of fiction and its criticisms, um, or, or just cosmopolitan fluencies in all the ways that humans articulate their worlds. But it does mean that these things, that these important things must be at the fore. But so for the propositional uh, anthropogenic technogenic uh, conversion that we, we speak of, the conjunction of philosophical and astronomic planetarity would, would require the, uh, the inclusion of numeracy as well as literacy uh, as part of that pedagogy. This is my argument. But for this then, numeracy would mean much more than just counting, uh, but a recognition of accounting uh, as the primordial form of writing. Accounting as in receipts, accounting as, was, as in accounting for what has happened, memory, projection. Just as literacy is not just the ability to read and write, um, but rather to be fluent in multiple conditions of articulation, musicality, and expression, it is not just comparative, it is not just comparative across the post-colonial nomos, but works at a much higher resolution. So too, numeracy is not just the ability to interpret statistics or program software, but both to comprehend, perceive, and generate the, assembly, the assemblages of the world through a creative appreciation of mathematical patterns. Needless to say, the two must interfere with one another. Um, 
w one must have mathematical literacy as, as much as one must have literary numeracy. To recognize, for example, that both algorithmic structures of prose and the general condition of information and biosemiotics are as available to us um, as mathematical notation as much as by alphabetic conjugation. So if the planetary is this way of knowing together that I believe is at the heart of, of Spivak's call for the demands of the general ability to think and write in both ways at once, um, it is because we have there it is because of because of and not despite of the uh, mutual technicity between the literacy and numeracy. Um, it is right because of it. Now, here's the thing. Unfortunately for the humanities, at the present moment um, at which we stare down the Anthropocenic cliff, um, these modes are not equal uh, and are not held to be equal, but are often held to be in stark contrast to one another. Uh, the commitments are drawn uh, between them, uh, which one is emancipatory and which one is oppressive. Uh, which is the way of the rebellion and which is the Death Star? Far more, uh, far more, uh, 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 far more than, far more, I think, I think than is even sustainable. The theoretical engagement uh, with technology is, I argue, preoccupied with simple maneuvers attempting to debunk technical reason as if the professional mastery of cultural theory requires that declaration of tribal allegiance. The vulgar and far too common sense in the arts and humanities of attaching the scope of equitable planetarity to subject bound ethics and experience uh, and experience is in a kind of performative opposition to numeracy and impersonal abstraction and rationality leads to then unfortunate conceptual slippages by which a useful analytic frame like, for example, algorithms of oppression becomes instead, as it has for many, algorithms are oppression. This reinforces uh, the invidious conclusion um, that the path to a viable planetarity is open through the defeat, not just of computational prostheses of structural exploitation, but the defeat of computation itself, both in theory and in practice. This is a propositional planetarity for which anthropogenesis is amputated from technogenesis. It is impossible. This, this disposition, and I always say, is not just a recent anti-innovation within the Western theoretical humanities and its approach to questions concerning technology, but sadly, I think it is one of the founding articles of its constitution. It is also one that works directly against the larger project of a viable planetarity. So the long but more or less uh, direct European passage from the Romantic poets to Nietzsche, to Heidegger, to the Frankfurt School, to Virilio, to Agamben, and so on, contends that technology as a whole and instrumental reason, which is of course, quote, bad, not, not only equate with one another, but that by their equation, the space of authentic emancipation is in some way defined by the conjoined, their conjoined negation or evasion. This is not only one among the central beliefs of European philosophy of technology, it is a central tenet of Eurocentric philosophy of technology. It is essential to maintaining the superstition that Europe is the original seat of universal reason. It is, is I'll only repeat that, this, con, the, this negation, is essential to maintaining the superstition that Europe is the original seat of universal reason. While it, well, in its geographic exterior, lives are led without the weighted curse of instrumental reason because their relationship to tools is led instead by direct need and organic community and cunning instinct and the direct visceral connection to elemental nature that the alienated victim of reason in Europe's core um, cannot, uh, will we'll have to actually try to use philosophy in order to recover. Now, this approach, to be clear, must be discarded. Uh, sorry, I'm struggling a bit with the, as you can see, struggling a bit with the thing. This figure of provocation, um, uh, the, uh, yeah, so the, the, a planetary philosophy of technology uh, as, as such, uh, Apologies, where this is not working as planned. Um, 
a, a planetary philosophy of technology, however, must be shorn once and for all of this of this provincial bad faith, of a kind of romantic malaise at having to bear the unique weight of technical reason. Unlike the, those organic toiling beings who live close to the soil without formal math, um, in concert then with the critique of the modern subject um, and this modern subject's self misrecognition, a planetary philosophy of technology might propose that the composition of a viable planetarity not only includes but entails the emergence of a different subject of reason, a different subject of reason. That subject of reason would host the, and would, would host the human and the inhuman, but also would, by definition, not be reducible to either one. It would be a subject of reason that is constituted, in fact, by its objectivity. That subject of reason, positioned in accordance with the demands of both philosophical and astronomic planetarity, would not only replace, displace the anthropos under scrutiny for any philosophy of technology, but particularly that which is under siege by the current genomic regimes that attempt to sort them into natives, migrants, citizens, and others. Why? Because the Copernican and Darwinian terms that would orient the world as planet and human as worldly creature are utterly incompatible, are utterly incomplete. And despite the biographies of those two men, that is Copernicus and Darwin, their deeper implications are one that instead of making Europe the necessary origin of the misrecognized individual subject of regions, it should have made Europe impossible in the first place. So, um, In this way, the, with the emergent inhuman subject and reason in mind, we might ask whether the planetarity is first an astronomic condition that precedes and exceeds us, but which is made manifest through our own histories, which constitute and are constituted by it. Now, let me turn quickly, let me turn for a moment then to um, this discussion, th this uh, th trying to locate this proposition in relationship to the uh, the, the connotations of a post-colonial uh, planetarity as proposed by Spivak and Mbembe, to try to, uh, Achille Mbembe, to try to form a bit, a bit of, a, of a contrast that hopefully clarify a bit what I mean. Spivak, for example, takes care to differentiate the connotations of planetarity from a simplistic um, custodial globalism. But in doing so, she takes equal pains to assure her readers that in order to accept her hypothesis, that the discipline of comparative literature uh, must give way to future literacies that she calls planetarity, they need not acquiesce to empiricism or cede the presumed royalty of theory to mere technoscience. This is the maneuver by which discursivity itself, its colonialities, its modernities, its insistence on mimesis, its erasures, come to stand for futurity, a staging which demands, perhaps inevitably, the continuing strategic, quote, ethical isolation and insulation of language and culture from biology, from geology, and from the physical engineering of worlds. All those things for her must be subordinated to the judgment of letters. And so with all due respect uh, and sincere respect for Spivak, it is perhaps unfortunate that in this way, the term planetarity is inaugurated by the tenuous differentiation of geoculture from geotechnology. Or perhaps there's a kind of gift in that the overcoming of that differentiation is the precondition for the emergence of the planetarity and the subject of reason. Perhaps the, tenuous, the tenuousness itself is the question that the subject of reason comes into being by answering. So in terms of the reception of, of Spivak's coinage of planetarity within the wider and diverse debates of the Anthropocene, it must be said that there is a considerable impatience with what is taken to be post-deconstruction's still too blinkered uh, focus on a textuality at the, as, as being at the root of all things, and the ease by which it will seem to imply, and then back away evasively when confused, that the human in all of its disguises is only nothing but an invention of discourse. Other approaches um, uh, than this insist not only on the materialization of language as a form of biosemiotics and technogenesis over time, but also, as in the work of the geographer Catherine Youssef and others, that the history of matter and material flows is constitutive 
of the intercontinental terraforming of modernity, including the formations of populations both inscribed and uninscribed. Her, for example, geologic realism includes histories of extraction, consolidation, territorialization, but does not differentiate this from the realism of an observational earth science, at least in theory, including astronomy and climate science, but implies, I think, an active collaboration with them, seeking to clarify the implications of their discourses for the present, future, and the past. The histories told then include the material technological conditions that make the, inf the, the conditions that make the information culture of literature possible in the first place. By contrast, however, <clears throat> by contrast, a fatal awkwardness stalks writers, and there are many, who simultaneously invoke the ongoing emergencies of climate collapse by referring evangelically to climate science and its polyvariant records of the planet's transformation over the past five centuries, its carefully conditional simulations of dire futures to come, all dependent on planetary scale sensing and modeling and computational infrastructure, as a motivating reason not only to comprehensively reorganize the world, but also, oddly, to fundamentally distrust or refuse entirely the epistemological demands of big data and calculative reason. Now, it is certain that planetary scale computation is deployed as part of the continuance of the new and old public and private forms of imperial violence. This is, I'm not questioning this at all. This cannot be in dispute. It, it, it is plainly true, but what else is true? From China and Europe and the Islamic world and elsewhere, through diverse coding systems and notional systems for formulating heuristic algorithms, computation was discovered, computation was discovered at least as much as it was invented. And upon this, it is used to calculate war and the weather, sometimes at once, and eventually almost everything else. We build societies through algorithms. We built societies through algorithms long before mechanical calculations machines existed. And indeed, those machines were innovated to accelerate the intensities of social algorithms of debt that long preceded them. The origins of written language as a technology of agricultural accounting attest to this as to any number, as do as to any number of arcane religious rituals. For this reason alone, no ultimate differentiation can be between literacy and numeracy can really hold. And so while the, the reductive social determinist conclusion is then that computation and even especially artificial intelligence is mostly only a sociomorphic mirror or repository of social relations, the historical philosophy of technology observes instead how across cultures, calculative technical systems make way for scientific epistemologies, such as this in the work of Georges Conguillem, which in turn inform cosmologies, which in turn inform geopolitics, as in the work of Bentley Allen, which may be called cosmotechnics all throughout, as in the work of Yuqui. Now, this is no less true of planetary scale computation, an accidental megastructure that automates the coupling of anthropogenesis, sociogenesis, and technogenesis at a scale that literally produces its own weather in ways that are modeled by the modern history of calculation, but are in no ways reducible to it, especially for the uncertain planetarity that is up for grabs. This is so because there is no one thing called planetary scale computation. Because of its functional preeminence though, computation as suggested has become a kind of easy target um, uh, for the criticism and resistance to the global distribution of power. Not, not, it's not surprising, which in turn leads to conclusive calls for its abolition uh, or diminishment. However, as suggested, sociogenesis stripped of technogenesis cannot hold any more than a literacy stripped of numeracy or vice versa can hold. And that is a symptomatic inversion of this mode of critique goes something like along the lines of if X is not Y, then not X must be Y. That is, if, 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 if injustice is, if computation leads to injustice, then justice must be non-computational. The role of planetary computation in this figuration of a violent, of, of a viable planetarity 
often man often uh, manifests as suggested in the identification of computation with oppression, and thereby the overcoming of oppression by all that is non-computational. Consider the, the following statement from Achille Mbembe uh, in a recent interview. He says that, quote, the colonial imperative is to render the world as computable and measurable, and thereby to exclude, demean, or suppress forms of knowing that are not easily computable or measurable. The result is to elevate computational knowledge, which is statistical, abstract, and, primary in the service, and primarily in the service of power. The imperative that is computational equates to the scope of reason, and thereby it not is not just itself not is not, not just itself true or not true, but it becomes the exclusive scope of relevant truth as such. Unquote. This leads him to conclude that the real relevant truth as such is to be found, therefore, not only by the reincorporation and revalorization of whatever modes of thinking computation excludes, but also by the overcoming of computation itself. He specifies that <clears throat> decolonization is the recovery of a way of thinking that is defined by non-computational ways and mores. Quote, in such a context, to decolonize must start from the assumption that knowledge cannot be reduced to computational information processing. There is therefore a massive need to recover the ability to think, unquote. And so for him, the path uh, to equity and viability is paved with the qualification, with qualification defeating quantification and thinking recovered at the expense of calculation. And what does he mean? Again, quote, colonization is going on when the world we inhabit is understood as vast fields of data awaiting extraction. Colonization itself, colonization itself, and then they claims is more a matter of quantification of the world than the poetic narrativization of rights of capture. In fact, the production of data about the world itself, by definition for him, is the presence of, of, of colonization. Quote, colonization is going on when we, throw out, when we throw out the window the role of critical reason and theoretical thinking, and we reduce knowledge to the mere collection of data, its analysis, used by governance, military bureaucracy, and corporations. Unquote. So Mbembe's commitment to critical reason and theoretical thinking makes worthy his call for the application of the power. No, no argument. But keeping climate scientists in mind for a moment, it's hard to know how that commitment can be realized without the governing exercise of quantitative, re quantitative abstraction. Throughout the interview, he formulates further necessary bindings of colonization and computation in ways, ostensibly, in, in various ways, ostensibly on behalf of a mode of literacy uh, that, that he feels should assume the throne. Quote, the 21st century is all about extraction, capture, the cult of data, the commodification of human capacity for thought and the dismissal of critical reason in favor of programming, quote unquote. His horror at the dangerously frivolous commodification of network desire and cognition that is today the normative deployment of planetary scale computation is utterly, totally warranted. But it's much harder to maintain the opposition between programming and critical reason as ways of thinking and, and making that actually exclude one another. I, I don't know how it could be more obvious, in fact, that programming is, in fact, a decisive mode of critical reason. The essential area of common cause um, here, mine with Mbembe's, um, is the position, uh, is, is, is that the position of computation within a more general transformation of knowledge um, into a, uh, uh, it, it is the way in which computation has been produced as a sort of general transformation of knowledge into adjacent reductive determinisms of uh, disciplinarity epistemologically. So he says, quote, part of what truly frightens me is the recolonization by various fields of knowledge by all kinds of determinisms. I agree. What frightens me is the active confusion between knowledge and data, the reduction of information to knowledge to information. It's the idea that the world is a matter of numbers and the task of knowledge is to handle quantities, unquote. Uh, uh, now, uh, oh, no, sorry, the quote continues. Furthermore, it's the belief that the best way to generate information is with computers and that which is not, and that which is not computable does not exist. It's the creeping sense that the computer is our new brain, unquote. He's clearly freaked out. Indeed, indeed, the, new su the subdivision of knowledge into increasingly narrow specialist fields comes with enormous costs. But among those costs is, is, is the almost 
automatic inflation of the ontological claims of each field into various fundamentalist determinisms, a computational determinism, an economic determinism, a political determinism, and as readers are well aware, um, a discursive, and, and as our audience here is well aware, a discursive determinism that, that is native to many, uh, that is made of uh, native to many uh, arts uh, and humanities uh, departments uh, programs and, and science and technology studies programs for that matter. Now, put directly, the critique of computational determinism by the humanities cannot be, con here's a, the critique of computational determinism by the humanities, by the arts, cannot be credentialized by an equally du dubious discursive determinism or worse, an affective experiential determinism that would posit language and meaning and sensation as doing more than they really possibly could. And Bembe, for his part, is surgically critical of the fortified separation of experience as the sovereign gated domain, unavailable to planetary pedagogy and shared literacy. And he repeats this emphatically, and I agree, he, in several ways. Um, and he does so even in this same interview. So in concert, with Bembe's criticism of reductive epistemic determinism, the pervasive doubling and tripling down on a discursive and experiential determinism cannot, can, can be recognized as this is what intellectual specialization and balkanization has done to the humanities. The simple notion that quantitative reason might reveal something about the world that is real in a naive sense more than it is the extraction and excretion of a hegemonic knowledge apparatus. And that, this, and that this revelation of the real might form the basis of humanistic interpretation is a strangely too difficult conclusion for many of my colleagues, which leaves the shared humanities project open to all kinds of spurious and politicized dismissals. Caution about this should not be merely academic. More, more is at stake. When Mbembe says that he is frightened by the reduction of knowledge to information, this can mean several things. For some, now, for some, this may be taken a bit like, for example, Agamben's bizarre, theologically inspired revulsion at the obscene aesthetics of medicine and genomic sequencing, and, or masks and vaccines, for that matter, as somehow profaning the natural divinity of the human. But I, I think Mbembo's point is actually much more productive and important than that. Still, the reduction ultimately is in how the fundamental preeminence of planetary scale computation has underwritten the exclusion of other forms of abstraction. And I don't argue with this point, such as those, such as those inspired by the theoretical humanities, making them appear irrelevant or, or, or stripping them of explanatory power or projective power, more importantly, projective power that's really at stake. So against this, it's possible and necessary to interpret uh, the tunnel vision of a functional computational determinism with contributions that undivide epistemology, that undivide epistemology from itself. To do so means to compose narrative, theoretical and allegorical abstractions from and for the disclosures that computation brings in ways that not only direct the humanities, but redirect computation's own project as well. The easier and much more prevalent path, however, is not this one that I described, but instead an increasingly simplistic fundamentalism for which subjective and qualitative experience, and indeed all, indeed all the things that count as literature in Spivak's project, is understood as the force and spirit of justice, whereas objective and quant quant quantitative reason is the corollary force of injustice. But by this, the mystic determinisms between literacy and numeracy become instead friend and enemy, defining one another by negation and inversion. This is why so many elaborate uh, critical responses to the dangers of computation and the dire violence of the global condition will conclude and with off, after often very precise critiques, with, they'll conclude with a kind of devastatingly vague anticlimactic call for a, a, quote, a new ethics, a new community of affectation, a direct and unmediated experience of care, a, quote, different way of being together, 
a quote, different way of knowing, perhaps a, a preliminary negative theology of the ventral first principles, but most of all, uh, the valorization of the ineffable. Now, in a mem and this is utterly, uh, utterly uh, 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 unacceptable. In Mbembe's words, a planetary curriculum is one whose strategic project is to understand, for example, for him, the planetary curriculum is one whose strategic project is to understand the incalculable and the in incomputable. That's the, that is the focus. It is the incomputable that is the, space of, that is the space of recovery. It can only be based on the will to go beyond cognitivism, he says. Now, unquote, this is the fallacy of inversion that is multiplied by disciplined discursive determinism. Once more, this negation and the open inversion on behalf of the ineffable undermines in advance the possibility of a realization of a viable planetarity. That's what's at stake. The negation and open inversion on behalf of the ineffable incalculable undermines in advance the possibility and realization of a viable planetarity. In the hands of someone less brilliant than those of than, than Achille Mbembe, this becomes literally the proclam proclamation that the ineffable and the incalculable is the space of justice because the computable and the measurable is the space of injustice. Simple as that. Now, beyond this, and on behalf of a shared commitment to a viable planetarity, we might ask why exactly are affect and poetry and, and, and passion and narrative and meaning and glory and the architectures of grand, grand eloquent significance not themselves on trial. Isn't the European conceit that it is the or, or origin of reason, one that operates on the divine right, the divine hereditary right of, of monarchs, uh, identified for vengeful God that underwrite colonial adventures, who conscript peasant soldiers under flags and anthems of the Eucharist, has a romantic longing and duty to plunder and convert, is this really the history of reason or is it the history of a formalized madness? If it is the latter, then why is reason on trial for it? Now, beyond this, and on behalf to conclude, <clears throat> beyond this, and on behalf of the shared commitment to a vitamin planetarity, um, we need to ask in another sort of way, again, this question of, of how it is it's possible to compose, in essence, another subject of reason, a subject of reason that, it is, that is defined not by the inheritance of that colonial adventure, not by its dichotomization of reason and unreason, not by it, its, its correlation of that dichotomy between the global, north, the global north and the global south, but the capacity for a, a, a mode of, of human, of human self-composition that is not only in relationship to the means of planetary sensing and modeling and simulation, understood as an epistemological technology, as an apparatus of collective intelligence and collective self-composition, but one that emerges from that directly. So let me conclude then, finally, with where we began to summarize a little bit of where we've been, and then we can, we can get to the more important part of the, our encounter, which is the conversation. We include then exactly where we began. The concept of climate change, what is planetary scale computation for? The concept of climate change is an epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation. Without the mega apparatus of sensing and calculation and simulation that is the basis of climate scientists, the relation between the invisible ubiquity of CO2 and the millennium long arc of, of mean temperature could not be inferred. In 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope Array stretched across the surface of the Earth to form the largest terrestrial camera that was ever, ever, ever possible, and so was able to, quote, photograph the M89 black hole, an image assembled from terabytes of data and received into a human legible form. What is the link and what is the lesson? It should be clear. Both demonstrate how it is that a planet may instrumentalize itself such that it can sense and model and simulate and predict its own condition and its own surroundings. This is what planetary scale computation is for. This is its positive capacity as a mechanism of public reason and collective self-representation. So instead of the over, instead of the surveillance of over-individuated humans endlessly congratulated for their unique desires, the political and philosophical challenges of this demonstrate another future for planetary scale computation and therefore for us and of the cloud along the way, of artificial intelligence along the way.
and of the tightly bound evolutionary arc between human prospection, our ability to conceptualize the future, and our own technical milieu. That is the binding. This alternative both depends upon other, uh, other philosophical invocations of planetarity, which I've attempted to indicate both positively and negatively in relationship to Spivak and Mbembe, and also challenges, as should be clear, their overconfidence in the liberatory superiority of literacy over numeracy, symbolization over calculation, and experience over abstraction. So thank you very much for your, for your attention, your time, and we can, I, I very much look forward to our conversation.